Well, it's 11 o'clock and we do have a jam-packed session, so we will make a start. On behalf of Carl and the Creek Committee, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia and New Zealand, where we live, learn and work. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to welcome and extend my respects to First Nations people attending today. Welcome to this final webinar in the first Caval Research and Information Group Forum Series of 2021, SOS, Selling Open Scholarship, Innovations in Librarians Advocating for Open Scholarship. If you have technical questions during the presentation, please type your question into the chat and the Caval team will assist you. Please use the hashtag Hash Creek SOS when commenting on social media during or after the webinar. Today's three presenters are M. Johnson, Research Services Librarian at Swinburne University of Technology, Stephen Chang, Coordinator Digital Literacies and Open Education at La Trobe University, and Eleanor Kohler, Program Manager, Scholarly Development Research at the University of Melbourne. Our speakers will speak about repositories, OER, and communication in the open scholarship space and much more. If you have questions for the speakers throughout the session, please ask them through the Slido link, which we have added to the chat and the rotating slides. If your question is for a specific speaker, can you please specify that so that we can ensure they're correctly directed? Alternatively, you can also go to slido.com or the Slido app and use the event code hash 752992. The event will conclude with a Q&A with the speakers facilitated by Linda Whitby. So without further ado, I'll pass on to Em. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Craig very much for inviting me to talk today. Uh, it's lovely to be here virtually with you all. Um, let me just start sharing my screen for you now. Okay, I hope that's good for everyone, if you can see it all. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is M. Johnson. I coordinate the library's Swinburne Research Bank Service, which is Swinburne's institutional repository. Uh, but first, it is uh, absolutely my honour to acknowledge as follows. The Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in the area known now as Moreland, where I live and work from home. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations communities who significantly contribute to the life of this beautiful, beloved land of ours. Okay, just quickly, um, this space that I'm talking about, this sector uh, is rife with acronyms. So I'm just gonna flash up a quick kind of little run through and reminder of some of the acronyms that might show on the slide. I'll try and take care to uh, spell them out while I talk, but in the interests of space and time, I will be kind of running through them reasonably quickly. Okay, timeline and context with Research Bank at Swinburne. Um, very quickly, kind of looks a little bit like this. Uh, research Bank was formed uh, as part of the uh, research quality framework and ARROW 
um, projects uh, which ran from 23, 2003 to 2006 and this was a partnership with Monash and the National Library and culminated in the development and implementation of uh, a system called VITAL, VTLS, which is a Fedora repository system. And next that happened was that the service was brought together, a dedicated repository repository team at Swinburne, which operated with its, within its own library department. Um, they implemented uh, some massive content harvesting and customer outreach. They did further development of content standards during this time, etc. Um, between this long period, uh, Research Bank uh, assisted the research office at Swinburne with some government benchmarking exercises, and that established some good um, uh, initial collaborative relationships with those two teams. But um, over that long period between 2007 and 2013, some, some stagnation set in with Vital as a repository system actually um, dropping off, being supported, uh, the development and external support sort of stopped. Um, uh, and the team support of the service uh, became uh, difficult to resource. So from the years of 2014 and 2015, the dedicated team approach for repository services was wrapped up. Um, at that point, it was uh, three people in the team plus extra system support. Uh, and the repository service was folded into the faculty liaison team, um, which meant that at that point, the, the shared uh, repository manager role, uh, myself and Dave, um, we trained up the liaison librarians group to do some content development for us in the, in the sort of in the collection. And we also delegated some service outreach and onboarding for newly recruited researchers to that liaison team too. Uh, by that point, Vital, the system was kind of definitely on its last legs, moving into 2000, to, sorry, to 2016 and 2017. Uh, we migrated from Vital across to Open Equella um, because we, we were using Equella already as a platform for a couple of other collections and services. So we had an in house Equella team. It's a really cost effective solution. Um, Equella isn't purpose designed for institutional repository workflows and reporting, but it is a great flexible digital open access collections interface. It's also a superb platform for the other digital collections, most especially uh, Swinburne Commons. At that time, the dual shared repository coordinator role was actually consolidated into the one person, uh, which is a full-time Q7 role, which is me. And I'm supported by staff time donated out of other teams, most specifically uh, the liaison area still. Um, and so at that point, we were deep into preparation for era 2018, uh, which created, uh, a, a dark repository, a collection. And so that kind of now at that point, we've got a research bank, which is one system, a dark repository um, getting developed up for era 2018. And also not mentioned yet, uh, the separate duplicated publications collection that happens across in the research office systems. Um, so that has triggered by that point a few years ago, this ob obvious and very necessary um, uh, review of our systems and sort of starting this process of mapping and deduplicating, um, which led us into just the most recent period, 2018 to 2020, where we actually um, did some more development of Equella. We mapped some systems and tried to deduplicate as much as possible. And then we embarked on um, a process of, of full review and assessment and then tender um, uh, to try and bring in a new research information management system for Swinburne. And then COVID hit, uh, which impacted all of our budgets. So that project was put into hiatus, but we got some gains out of it anyway. 
So today the team is now structured for Research Bank is me. I am now at point eight um, full time loading, and I'm supported by um, donated time plus one uh, reporting relationship under me, out of different teams um, and effectively manage the collection and the service in that way. A current research information management system ecosystem is duplicated, as I mentioned. So across in the research office, we've got Research Master, which sits behind an interface called Swinburne Research Analytics, and they manage uh, the uh, era and non-traditional research object collection. They manage um, uh, engagement and income and grants and analytics, and they feed some biographical information to profiles, the Swinburne um, public web profiles for researchers. Here in the library with Research Bank, the repository, we're managing also a duplicated era pubs collection process. Um, some of that data gets harvested back into um, research analytics where it's not already available through Scopus. We also collect and curate non era publications and outputs and works. Um, a little bit of, of the nitros are also collected in there. We also obviously manage all of the open access deposit and compliance issues and we feed, uh, we are the sole source of the publications feed into profiles. Um, we achieve this feed into profiles despite by the way the lack of a persistent identifier that links people seamlessly to their publications. So we are managing a highly manual process of matching people by their published names variations um, to their profile uh, publications, which is yeah, a difficult and challenging process. And we're looking forward to a solution for that as soon as possible. So as I might have mentioned, we started mapping uh, pain points between the two duplicated and gappy kind of research information management systems running at Swinburne. Um, we kind of picked up on, I, I would say, because I was involved and it was a highly um, detailed process, all of the pain points. That's a little flash behind there of, of what we alerted. And so I'm building up a context here of the kind of environment that we're working and providing open access kind of services in my team so, sort of solely um, against a background of fair, a fair amount of complexity and manual process and duplicated systems. But I'd like to move us directly now into talking about how we're communicating and supporting open access from my team. Um, I'd like to specifically point out right now that um, my focus for today's talk is going to be on open access for researchers and publishing researchers and sort of approaching the communication of that service from that perspective. Um, but the library uh, broadly has made some, ex has also made some great progress in recent years, which is the development of collections platforms and internal skills and knowledge to support open educational resources for teachers and students at Swinburne. Um, it's important to raise this because even though my focus um, and some of the challenges around um, communicating for open access for researchers is what I'm going to finish my talk on today. I'd like you to understand that there are also other services and communications happening out of the library for the OER kind of aspects of open access. But I'd like you to come with me now and I'm going to pose for you um, a couple of challenging kind of questions while I talk about it and go forward. Over time, um, I've developed a fair amount of knowledge and expertise around open access for researchers. Obviously, that's my primary focus in my role. Um, but I've also participated and watched as my team have developed up um, the OER kind of service communications, open access, supporting open access for educational resources and curriculum. Um, which my observation has been has been largely around assisting with access to those resources, which is in something which is in fact something that librarians and academic librarians especially uh, 
that's been our whole professional focus. We know how to do that. It's a comfort zone for us. So stepping up in that area has been a, just a, manage, a matter of sort of tweaking and changing the language and then focusing on different and innovative kind of accesses into information. Um, supporting open access for publishing researchers is a very different kettle of llamas and it, it really does require learning new skills and specialist expertise um, and it does involve stepping out of that comfort zone and interacting as I say with some of the scarier parts of the university. Um, the And I'm calling it scary really it's just a shortcut way some of us really welcome that challenge and take on that kind of role and step up confidently but it can be confronting for um, people who are not used to interacting with those areas and kind of asserting authoritative expertise which we have in this field when you're in a room full of senior researchers senior research administrators administrators deans deans of research etc we're also um, contextually often called upon to expose what I would consider as being the dark underbelly of library licensing and agreements with publishers and, and in some matter some of the financial and budgetary kind of tangles and realities that are sort of hard to swallow around um, the big deal agreements with publishers, the possible double dipping, the exposure of gigantic fees for gold open access. And navigating that conversation is hard uh, if um, there are sensitive or controversial issues that are kind of brought out during the conversation. So it's not your normal comfort zone for a librarian to do this. I love doing it personally but it is definitely amongst the most challenging and sometimes stressful aspects of my role. And right now is right contextually uh, important for me to say again it, that I can't do it without the support and backup from champions and allies in more senior roles amongst my colleagues in the library, as well as out amongst my stakeholders in the research office and further. So, <laughs> Along with a poorly, what I would consider to be a poorly integrated research information management ecosystem and a legacy of some research quality strategic messaging that presents gold open access quite often as the only alternative. This introduces further complexity into the process of communicating open access in and out of my area making my workflows or our workflows and services difficult for researchers um, to navigate and to be aware of. So let's have a look at um, the researcher journey in understanding open access in their areas, summed up by this slide. It is complicated. Um, support services, guidelines, policy, compliance reporting, etc., is a complicated um, landscape to navigate. There's often confusion and ignorance about the roles and permissions. There's not a lot of transparency um, around the payments and the open access fees. Uh, the perception sometimes that green open access isn't as good as gold open access. Ignorance over uh, the perceptions on the united directions and messaging from research managers around this area. There's not a lot of very holistic communication strategy. Excuse me, just one moment. So I'm going to skip forward quickly and give you a quick look of what I managed to do in this area with this complexity in terms of communicating what we can provide support for in uh, Research Bank and out of the library. We did get a very good understanding of, of some of the perceptions um, amongst our user group and our customer base um, with a Swinburne sort of um, open science task force survey recently, which was a sort of a look at um, what they understand of and how they use open access practices in their areas. This was a broader focus on 
open science practices, but I was invited to contribute language um, uh, and collaborated on the design of some of the surveys. So it was able to deliver me some extremely interesting looks at how Swinburne researchers perceive um, and use open science practices in their areas. Along the bottom lines on both of these tables here, it gives you an indication of gray shading to dark blue where grey is either not perceived as very important or doesn't have a lot of experience with uh, and the dark blue areas indicating amongst those that answered the survey um, whether they just thought those practices were important or whether they actually involved themselves in using them at all. And that's going to feed into our, our further kind of development and design of communications around this area and it has been a really worthy and um, important process for us to work through. And I did this alongside um, the group of both academic um, kind of senior academics and research office uh, representatives who designed and rolled out the survey at Swinburne and that's available openly um, and you can find it and I'll leave um, some links to, for the audience if they're interested in taking a look at the results of that. Moving on very quickly now where did the llamas come in? <laughs> I'll move on. So while we're articulating and advocating for open access at Swinburne I found the most uh, effective approach out of my team has most definitely been meeting academics in their space and talking them to them one-to-one uh, -one and explaining at the point of need how we can support them with green open access and deposit into the repository and all of the other services available through our systems. This is a personal, highly high touch kind of um, a highly focused approach to communications, but it's the best way to navigate complexity while those systems are difficult and while those barriers exist. So I make it easy for them, but it does involve a personal conversation. Some examples of how I talk about this in a non kind of face to face or one to one would would include how we've designed the interface and the forms that are used for research bank deposit. We've made them as simple and as contextual as we possibly can. Um, and the navigation is directly from the research profile into uh, the research bank forms interface. Open Equella has allowed this. It does have a very flexible forms design. I've created a wiki which talks about open access for researchers and gives it sort of boils it right down to the simplest possible approaches and information. I've got some uh, information up in the research intranet web space, uh, which again gives a little bit more context and explanation, especially walks people through the mandatory open access compliance with funder policies. And just last week, I'm very excited to say that Swinburne uh, launched an, a statement on open science. This again is only in the intranet environment, but it simplifies and directs and makes some statements and, and holds a position on some of the open science practices. So I'll be very interested to see how this develops up and I'll be contributing to this as it happens. I've created some handouts which splits out the, the two broader open access options for publishing researchers. I'll be meeting with dean, uh, deans from some of the more funded uh, ARC kind of areas and walking them through this as soon as possible. And I do lean again on the former AOASG or Open Access Australia infographics for a simplified workflow. And this is something that sits inside the researcher's own context and that they can reach for at the point where they need to access that service. And finally, we're looking at some projects in the future to complete and reinvigorate this approach for a brand new research information system that will make a huge difference to our interfaces and I think it will probably force some streamlining um, and possibly even policy guided approaches to embedded open access engagement, especially in research publishing. 
and the library itself has actually formed and it was very exciting to be part of this uh, priority focus on open access for 2021 and I'm involved personally in some of the projects relating to research services in that area. Thank you so much. I went a little bit over. I'm sorry about that. Um, and I'm very happy to ask any questions that come up. And I'll hand back to uh, our directors for the rest of this. Thank you, Em. Thank you. Great to hear about what's happening at Swinburne. And um, I hope your solution will be forthcoming. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Stephen. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, also, please say hi to my co-presenter, Kiara, who's currently napping on the couch. Um, I'm going to talk today about how we can advocate for the learning and teaching side of open access. And along the way, we're going to encounter some Trojan horses and a couple of indulgent touches of anthropology and philosophy to help us. There's a triple crisis that I want to highlight to background this talk, and that is for students, the cost of education and living is steeply rising, and at the same time, student income and job security is increasingly precarious. For libraries, publishers are continuing to charge skyrocketing prices for collections that increase year on year, and meanwhile, library budgets are under the crunch. So this is unsustainable for everyone. In terms of learning models, we've gone, we've all gone online because of COVID. Um, yet we've still got one foot in a print-centric traditional pedagogy. It's surprisingly common and dominant still. And part of that is that restrictive commercial licensing suppresses so many of the possibilities enabled by uh, learning online. Unsurprisingly, I'll argue that OER, Open Educational Resources, are a key solution to some of these crises. And that's because they're the opposite of commercial resources. Uh, rather than being licensed ex for exclusivity, for commercialization, they're licensed in ways that deliberately enable equitable, flexible and accessible new ways of doing learning and teaching. You know, they're free, they can be repurposed, it's a whole other ball game. Um, over the last few years, I've learned what doesn't work for me in advocating for open access and OER. This includes focusing too much on you know, the free access, free stuff, appealing to raw alt altruism on the part of our stakeholders and relying on blind enthusiasm. I think we need to combine our enthusiasm with a um, careful planning of the way we do advocacy. And I'm gonna to argue today that a big part of that is recognizing how, how deeply difficult this task is and how much gets lost in translation when we, when we talk past our stakeholders. To highlight a couple of examples, we might say research support, and we're talking about library services, but our stakeholders may hear monetary support, grants, oh, where, where can I apply for this money? Um, we might say openly license your work, um, and our stakeholders may hear, oh, so you want, you want people to, let, to be able to steal my stuff, my reputation will be at risk. And there's nothing wrong with any of these concepts or words, and I said, I'm certainly not suggesting that we don't use them, but rather I'm trying to highlight the gulf between what we want to say and what our stakeholders sometimes hear. So if our messaging isn't working, uh, maybe we need a Trojan horse to sneak it, sneak it all in by stealth. And that was kind of the title I came up with. Um, admittedly, we're not at war with our stakeholders in a medieval era. And also, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that we should hide or obscure open access agendas in any sense. But I think this analogy can get us to think about the structure of our arguments. What form do they appear to our stakeholders as? What's housing or containing the message? And how do we get inside the gates? You know, what packaging are we using to articulate our message? In other words, how are we framing things? Um, how are we starting conversations? If we're framing things in terms of open, but our stakeholders don't clearly understand what open is, which in OER is about 70, 80, 90% of the academic audience, then it's gonna be a struggle. Um, it begins from outside the stakeholders framing, framing. And you might say, well, just define open. But the problem is that defining the term doesn't put the defined concept inside the stakeholders frame of reference. 
it still confronts them as something that's something foreign, as that library thing that I don't have time for. By contrast, if the framing begins inside their life world, then the conversation unfolds from a place that's intrinsically meaningful to them before you introduce unfamiliar, scary concepts, if you want to call it that. So a uh, short side journey now into anthropology to help us think about this. Anthropologists often describe their mission this way, making the strange familiar and the familiar strange. And this approach is used to compare cultures, to build common understanding, seeing ourselves in others and seeing otherness in ourselves. And I think we can use this for thinking about advocacy because what we're talking about here is basically intercultural communication, right? Between professions. And professions are cultures of a sort. Um, library land, if you want to call it that, is a culture with a linguistic community, with internal norms, habits, practices, and the ways that we use language. So I think if we can recognize that we inhabit a life world with the internal familiar frame of reference, this can help us think about how our motivations and, and incentives are different from other life worlds. For example, our profession is subject to pressures from you know, arguably extortionate pricing by publishers, which means we have an intrinsic and obvious collective interest in the success of open access. By contrast, academics are subject to systems that incentivize prestige paywalls, which tends to build up a, a tension or a dichotomy between open access and their individual career goals. And I think if we can put distance between ourselves and our own familiar norms, we can inhabit their perspective a bit more because often we're too close to our own assumptions. So in the spirit of making the strange familiar and the familiar, the familiar strange, I thought it was worth reflecting on the, challenge, the challenging thought processes and some of the risks that academics might take in transitioning to an OER um, text. Sticking with the status quo commercial textbook or resource might feel to them familiar, might enjoy consensus among colleagues, be in the footsteps of decades of departmental tradition, might feel safe and stable. Changing to OER, um, even if they recognise it's the right thing to do, might feel uh, unfamiliar, risk-taking, feelings of sticking their neck out and making, making a gamble that requires quite a lot of courage from them. And one academic told me that, you know, they were supportive of OER, but the time and effort that it would take them might mean delaying their research publications, lengthening their already 12 hour work days and spending less time with their family and friends on the weekends. And that's not usually what we associate with open access, right? But that can be the reality for some of our stakeholders. I guess part of what I'm saying here is that some of our usual objectives in advocacy, like speaking the language of our stakeholders is a really good start, but I think it needs to go further, that we need a deep understanding of their practices, their forms of life, if you will, and engage with those to whatever extent that we can. And maybe this level of engagement requires immersion, or um, a colleague and I just like invented this term two days ago, benevolent infiltration. You know, getting out of the library into the wild, inhabiting spaces outside our life world. Um, nothing revolutionary or new. We've been talking about this for a while in the profession, but we've still got a long way to go with it. For example, how many of us can confidently say that we systematically understand the internal agendas um, and horizons of our stakeholders? If we're being honest, I don't think that many of us can say that. A really practical way um, and a big step towards this uh, deep understanding, I think, is an ongoing presence at faculty meetings and representation on academic committees. Um, if you're not already part of these bodies, I think you should probably actively campaign to get a recurring invite, a standing item on these, you know, even a five minute standing item on these faculty meetings is worth its weight in gold, not just to transmit outreach messages, but also to build that deep internal cultural understanding. Um, some examples are one of our senior library managers is on a course review committee full of academics. I don't think they've ever had a li library staff on them. Um, and one of our research data management staff is on the research ethics committee. So, you know, kind of unintuitive for library staff, but 
Um, this presence provides uh, precious insight into those internal agendas of our, our stakeholders, which are otherwise um, total labyrinths to navigate and often invisible. Right, so once you've got the Trojan horse inside the gates, success, you're now benevolently infiltrating another life world. You're now in you know, the right space to listen, link and lead. And this is a theory of how change occurs in higher education. Applied in our context, it might mean that we listen to pedagogical pain points or struggles with an existing resource being used in the courses. And we then link those struggles of the stakeholder, the academic, to changes that can be enabled by OER that will solve the problem. And then we lead by facilitating action and infrastructure that will actualize those changes. And hopefully you can see what this means for the structure of our advocacy, um, how that's different from the model of, hi, I'm here to talk about open access. Here's why free access is good. You know, that can work sometimes, but it has its limitations. Whereas listen, link and lead is more about careful listening, probing, identifying opportunities for these gateway openers that link with solutions um, to those struggles made possible by OER. Um, here are some examples. And, you know, so maybe rather than starting your presentation with uh, Open Access 101, you might say, hi, I'm here to talk about student welfare and equity in the COVID context and, and be beginning inside that frame of reference. Um, one example might be an academic says, oh, well, the student feedback said that the readings weren't relevant enough and I, I want to improve that. And you can meet that and say, yeah, I, I recognise that that's important. Let's align the readings with your way of teaching the course. Um, how about you create your own resource using our library OER publishing service? You know, there'll be alignment between your voice, the content will be perfectly matched. You're both the author of the text and the lecturer using your own text. Um, and so notice in this how OER is almost the middle to last step. And the starting point is really inhabiting someone else's frame of reference, listening carefully, and that's where the magic begins. Um, right, so from this perspective I've described so far, maybe advocacy looks a bit more like this. Um, and these, these headline items are mostly things that are on the internal agendas that are of our stakeholders and are you know, intelligible priorities for them and their everyday practices. Um, a word of caution, I guess. Um, some of these arguments to support OER may need scaffolding. Um, again, this is learning from mistakes I've made. I once uh, started an uh, introductory presentation on OER to academics talking about openly licensing your work, you know, the most scary thing. And the whole discussion turned into the most intimidating aspects of open access and the anxiety of copyright violation, et cetera. And it became, the conversation became about reassuring them that open access is not traumatic, you know, rather than a discussion about solving problems. So don't start with the scary stuff. At risk of being overly schematic, maybe we can think about this in terms of levels. So start with the low hanging fruit first. Um, for example, everyone is for equity and affordability, accessibility, or at least knows they have to be seen to be addressing those problems. So you can talk about textbook affordability, um, equity, and you can talk about you know, adopting an unmodified OER that exists. That doesn't require too much copyright knowledge and um, is a good place to start as an action item. And once they're on board with the basics, you can start talking about trickier stuff like moving the conversation from the resource or the textbook to towards the learning and teaching practices of the course and how those two things are linked. For example, what's the relationship between the resource and the way the course is taught? Does it suit the Australian context? How do students engage with the text in a way that's you know, rich and provocative? Or how can we enable that? Is there a role for this text in assessment? Um, you can also talk about um, calls to action that are more difficult, like localizing or Australianizing uh, OER by modifying them. That requires new copyright knowledge for most academics. So it's a bit of a step up. 
And once you've built a person or a community into becoming OER champions, then you can start talking about the scary stuff. Um, for example, openly licensing work to be modified by anyone in the world with an internet connection. This will be perceived as risky, but hopefully they're now equipped with the confidence and the intrinsic motivation to pursue that. Um, some other strategies are the OER sandwich, which is just a term I use to describe like advocacy from above and from the grassroots and doing that in a synergistic way. I think it's also very important to leverage their peers because most studies show that the biggest influence on academics are their peers. And so mobilize, so we should mobilize those peers by using you know, real life OER case studies featuring their, their peers um, and leveraging existing OER champions to speak alongside you. Um, another tip is to show the actual OERs, don't, um, so that it's less abstract, you know, share your screen or, or link them to the OER. I find when I share the screen and show them the actual product, that's a big conversation starter and they get drawn into it. They start asking questions, start saying, oh, maybe, maybe I can use that. It looks really good. Um, also, don't go it alone um, at La Trobe. I think most of our wins have been achieved collectively, even though I'm the coordinator of open education. It's, it's not really been me directly. It's, it's been a collective effort of our outreach staff engaging these conversations in departmental meetings and also, you know, sharing mistakes, lessons, um, strategies with each other. Also, persistence is really important. Sometimes it takes three, four, five goes at it to even get started. Um, once you started these conversations, you will often encounter concerns and fears about OER. And um, I think it's just about calmly addressing these in an evidence-based way and doing your research about it. For example, the quality question is always, always going to come up. Academics will say, oh, but these OERs, they're lower quality, aren't they? They're free. You get what you pay for. And I think we should um, anticipate that and know the evidence that actually um, provides a counter argument to that. I've linked to a couple of seminal studies here. We can also clarify, what do you mean by quality? Because that's a, that's a big conversation. Um, what about quality of access? That's about quality too. And also pointing to examples of high quality peer reviewed OER like the OpenStax series. Um, okay, let's say hypothetically you've persuaded everyone or a large majority of the stakeholders and won them to open. Then what, or so what? You know, persuasion I think is just a means to action and practice. You might've convinced a whole bunch of people to cross to the other side, but there's no bridge to get there unless that's been put in place. So calls to action require real life enablers. And I think for us, that is infrastructure, platforms and services. I think grants are really important because um, an academic's most precious resource is time and time is money. So that's a way we can tackle that. Um, I also think it's important to fill a key gap, which is the lack of Australian content in the OER world. Um, and something we can do is create OER publishing platforms at La Trobe. We do this through the La Trobe eBureau, which is the library as publisher model. So we can create those, those Australian OERs. And also I think it's important to make all of those findable for everyone. And so hopefully in the near future, we can put together an Australasian OER repository together. So long story short, I think infrastructure and that strategic stuff is part of advocacy, not separate from it. Um, so just a few final musings, I guess. So reflecting on the Trojan horse metaphor, I guess I was just trying to say, you know, the internal agendas and the everyday problems of our stakeholders are the starting point. That's the vehicle for getting inside the gates. Let's, let's situate open as a solution in that context rather than a standalone topic that confronts our stakeholders as outside their frame of reference. Um, a lot of the things I've said today can be encapsulated or actioned in like writing a really good thoughtful communications plan, building consensus around that and, and putting that into action. So that's something I recommend. 
Um, a shameless plug for the core modern curriculum project on OER advocacy, which I'm a part of at the national level. Keep your eyes on that. We'll be producing some OER toolkits, uh, advocacy toolkits. Lastly, what does success look like? Well, um, at La Trobe, by listening, linking and leading, we've got 11 OER written and published by our academics through the La Trobe e Bureau and one of our star techs research and evidence in practice save students up to $164,000 per semester because they don't have to buy commercial texts. We've also, through advocacy, flipped a handful of courses to OER, which provides real life case studies to build um, momentum. So yeah, from little things, big things grow. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it was great to hear about your work in OER and particularly about the approaches you've taken. Um, at this stage, I'd now like to hand over to Eleanor. Hi, everyone. I will share my screen with you. And there we go. Alrighty, so hi, my name is Eleanor and today I'm discussing librarian language spoken by librarians. I would, uh, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Wandri, Wauraung and Burrung people of the Kulin Nation who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. I thank them for their care of the land, the water and the air and acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend this to all Indigenous and First Nations people here today. Sovereignty was never ceded. I would also like to acknowledge another one of my privileges. I hold a permanent ongoing position in a tertiary institution, something that is becoming rarer by the day. Whilst this presentation isn't about to spark a revolution, uh, this position of secure employment does allow me some room in which to present on topics which we may potentially push back on the status quo. So this presentation is an exploration of my experiences and reflections on the language used around open scholarship. Speaking after Em and Stephen, it seems they're also having really similar thoughts and experiences as well. I'm teasing out a few ideas, non-completed thoughts, and kind of around conversations and barriers that kind of informed trained professionals of all kinds um, that we're taking part in both knowingly and unknowingly. Um, the use of discipline specific language can definitely be a good thing. Uh, however, when I apply these conversations we're having around open scholarship, I'm encountering more confusion than clarity. So I'll start with a clarification. Uh, I take open scholarship as an umbrella term encompassing open research or depending where you're based geographically, open science and open educational resources. Um, my work background lies in open research. So which I guess uh, this statement highlights some of the issues here. Do we say open research or open science? Is it a given that open scholarship encompasses both open research and OERs? What is sitting behind open research and behind OERs? And how often is this changing? How often is the language changing with it? And where are these changes coming from? Is it, is it librarians? Is it publishers? Is it the publishing community? Uh, welcome to Library Land. We speak librarian. Uh, this was highlighted very well by M providing an acronym slide at the beginning of their presentation. Uh, not the first time I've seen that approach happen and it definitely wasn't planned, but I'm so pleased that that did happen. Um, throughout recent years, I have regularly attended the Open Access Australasia Community of Practice meetings. Uh, which has highlighted not just how diverse issues relating to open scholarship and this specific context open access are, but how complex and diverse the language we use is, even just between institutions across Australia. At the Australasian meeting late last year, this was only increased when we were joined by colleagues from New Zealand Aotearoa. So I guess the crux of the whole thing is a lot of language we use to discuss topics within open scholarship is confusing and doesn't really mean much out of context. And is this something we, we can change and do we want to? As I develop my career, how I communicate about open scholarship also aligns with how I communicate with many elements of librarianship and scholarly communications more broadly. In various roles, I have uh, have communicated with a broad range of people, both internal and external to the library, 
particularly people involved with publishing and scholarly communication more broadly. These people weren't necessarily publishing themselves, but also worked with researchers uh, and graduate students in these areas. And I found that a portion of this work, the communi communication is translating work, and Stephen definitely touched on this in the talk as well. Uh, this was really highlighted um, by some work I've been undertaking in the research management space, uh, speaking a lot with research managers. And I once had a conversation with staff in the research office about all the work, the amazing work that the library does uh, with postgraduate students around open scholarship. And only to have them ask several minutes in why I thought it was the library's place to be discussing scholarships that were open to students. Uh, and I think that really highlights some of the use of language and the confusion around that uh, that, that can happen. So there's also an element of implicit bias in all of this as well. Uh, we often talk about traditional publishing or open publishing. This falling under the banner of the open research, open science, which is more broadly part of open scholarship discussion. Traditional publishing, what do we mean by this term? Uh, using traditional implies an established, thus good, secure, well-regarded model of publishing. Anything else, anything other is by default, not good, not secure, not well regarded. From the beginning, we are centering what could just as easily be called closed publishing. This also comes through with how we list types of publishing models. I cannot recall ever seeing open publishing listed first. We then often bring predatory publishing up directly after discussing open publishing. Why? It needs to be discussed, but not just with open publishing. Closed publishing also has a history of predatory and unethical publishing. By presenting open publishing and predatory publishing always together, we're inviting them to be seen with equal status and equal wariness. We also tend to add a lot of qualifiers and clarifications around open publishing. Many library resources hasten to add that open publishing includes peer review and copyright and holds academic weight. Yes, it does. But these qualifiers aren't highlighted nearly as often as with closed publishing again, assuming that it's all just part of the deal. I reference here the work of Collister and Cantrell, who've got a great piece on this. In a recent OCLC report under the heading cross-campus relationship building strategies and tactics, uh, the report highlights becoming familiar with the language uh, of other areas used across campus as a key takeaway for intercampus social interoperability. I think the work that Em and Stephen have shown today really highlights the benefits and use of taking the time and effort to learn the different language being used. Also, just a random side note, um, the nuance of language, in this report, they refer to the people who provided data, so the participants or interviewees, as informants. Uh, they did this 60 times in the report. Uh, I found it quite off-putting. Uh, and I think that also kind of highlights the nuance of language and, and cultural norms, whether it's in and outside of libraries or across geographic bounds. We do. Probably, honestly, not much. Uh, <laughs> But I will present a few small changes that I've been able to make in my work and my practice. Uh, drawing on some examples from the University of Melbourne from when I was able to both uh, update and create new resources uh, concurrently. And this provided an opportunity to apply some of the principles that I've been thinking and reading about. So what we did is we took the approach of updating a website, which is on the, the two boxes on the left and a libguide, the box on the right, as a pair of resources, each referring to others at the other at key points. Creating them concurrently also allowed for a clearer purpose of each resource. Whilst the audience is quite familiar, um, similar to each of these, we focus the website on the what and the why and the libguide on the practical how to. As a way to use clear and more concise language, we refer to different publishing models as OA in repositories, OA journals, books and proceedings, and hybrid publishing. We do not mention green, gold, bronze, black, library cartas. At the end of each page on the website is a direct link to the libguide with the practical how to achieve this information. We're also moving away from the binary. 
And we have taken the conscious decision to center resources and discussions around open scholarship, not being about closed versus open, but rather on a continuum. We hope researchers engage and reflect on ways they can set themselves up now to be able to make their research, whether that be a data set, a code, a thesis, a publication, open in the future. For many, open access publishing is a luxury with a dollar value attached to it. But hopefully this approach allows a future where people can have more open research, even if they can't achieve it right now. In order to move away from linking open publishing with predatory publishing, we consciously do not address predatory publishing on the open research we've got. Rather, we link to the broader open, uh, sorry, with the broader scholarly publishing we've got under a section that discusses various kinds of risks regarding many kinds of publishing practices. Done a few uh, presentations uh, and informal discussions with students, researchers, colleagues, other professional staff uh, across campus when highlighting these resources. Um, so far, the feedback has been positive. Whilst there's still a lot of translation work and still a lot of discussions around terminology, I feel that understanding and comprehension has improved and happens at a faster rate and that conversations can progress further. Most notably, the recognition that open research can be difficult to achieve given number of factors, career stage, income, disciplinary norms, and that doesn't have to be approached as an either or scenario has really opened up conversations and people seem to be more receptive to have a dialogue about these topics. There's still a lot to do. I haven't even spent any time on publisher agreements and the absolute thesaurus that is needed uh, to read one of these as well as the amazing work being done by our colleagues in the critical cataloging space. Um, but I am pleased with the small progress that's underway. At the same time, you know, pulling back from discussing open scholarship and looking at this more broadly, would we lose part of our identity if we change our language? I identify strongly as a librarian. Uh, identity and librarian are complex issues within their own rights, uh, but my identity as a librarian is likely different to everyone else's. Within the tertiary environment, libraries, along with many of our colleagues in other areas, are being systematically underfunded, under-resourced and undervalued. This is leading us to form collaborations and alliances in other areas. This is a good thing. However, if our users don't know where a resource or a service is coming from, if they don't know they're using a database that the library has paid for or are completing an information literacy assignment that a librarian has developed or are finding out information on publisher agreements through a library website, how will they advocate for us? If our identity is subsumed into a larger centralised service delivery model and if we have no discipline specific terminology to use, no one can identify us no one can identify our profession, and no one can identify the work that we do. No one can advocate for us. So before I spiral kind of like any further into that, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, these are some, I haven't been doing this work in isolation, absolutely not at all. Um, here are some of the resources I mentioned explicitly, as well as a few others I've drawn upon that have informed my thinking. It's definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, it's also not in a correct bibliographic format, I'm aware, but um, with the metadata provided, I'm sure you can kind of figure out what to do with all of that. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'll leave it there. And I think we've still got a few minutes for a very brief uh, Q&A. Cheers. Thanks very much, Eleanor. I think we... Um... We could talk about this for ages and you guys are so wonderful that we're only starting to get some little questions coming through on Slido just now. So the one that's probably at the, the top of the list, which is directed to all of you, is this. Do you think there should be dedicated infrastructure that supports academic staff in producing an open work, much like the commercial publisher would provide? So if anyone wants to answer that. I could I could just um, speak from a perspective of uh, embedded infrastructure, maybe for supporting publishing researchers. Um, certainly, uh, 
embedded infrastructure for OER and design and, and, and kind of output would be a different prospect. But um, uh, I've discovered that um, if, if systems or workflows for green deposit, for example, so the deposit of accepted manuscripts, um, preprints, etc., was built in uh, systematically and kind of turns up in front of the researcher at the time that, that it's c contextually relevant to them, um, then it smooth, smoothly flows through. Um, but if it is a process of them having to remember to follow up and then find the system and negotiate the service, then it really won't happen. So in that context, yes, that is absolutely cr critical, critically important uh, to improve that. Um, but I can't speak to the OER kind of side of that. Thanks, Sam. Oh, uh, I can answer that. Um, in a word, yes. <laughs> and I'd go as far as to say that um, I think we can only achieve so much by doing advocacy really in terms of like language, communication, that sort of thing, really well. It, even if we do it perfectly, we'll hit a limit. And that limit is because of the lack of infrastructure. Uh, I'd go as far as to say as if we don't invest in infrastructure, we will never reach our goals at a kind of mass level because you need that structure. And I think some really crucial things are the technical platforms. So platforms that academics can go into, easily use and don't take time too much time to learn. Um, a lot of Australian institutions are jumping on board Pressbooks, which is a OER publishing software, easy to use. Um, so that's a big trend at the moment. Um, incent uh, infrastructure of incentives are really important. So that might include grants. There's a couple of academic libraries putting out OER grants at the moment, which allows academics to buy out the time, which they currently don't have, to do that work. Um, and also, you know, uh, criteria for academic awards and promotions need to include something that can be linked to creating OER and that sort of thing. So those are a couple of key infrastructure things that I'd suggest, as well as OER um, staffing. You know, more, more positions like mine would be helpful. Thanks very much, Stephen. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover any other questions. It's been great that Anne's been able to answer some of them in Slido for us, but it's obviously a conversation that will continue. So thank you from my behalf, at least, um, for the three of you for providing such wonderful tips and really practical ideas.